Good evening, I'm Kevin Shuker and this is Health Box. Tonight we're coming to you again from Bonobo's Restaurant and I'm here with Donna Peroni from Accent on Wellness as part of our ongoing lecture series here at the restaurant. So Donna, who do we have here this evening? We have Dr. Joel Furman. Uh, he's a medical doctor and he specializes in preventing and reversing disease using natural and holistic methods. <laughs> uh, and of course he's an author. He's written three books. His latest is Eat to Live, which is what he's going to be discussing tonight, which is the greatest diet ever. Uh, he also has... Um, yeah, I have one book. here. We have yeah. Fasting and Eating for Health, which yeah. is another book by Joel Furman. And he has a third one, Cholesterol Protection for Life. So he's quite an accomplished author, and we're really looking forward to uh, tonight's lecture. So let's all sit back and enjoy Dr. Joel Furman. University graduate program in human nutrition. 
Dr. Berman has spoken at hundreds of locations throughout the U.S. and Canada, and his television appearances include many, such as Good Morning America, The Today Show, America's Talking, TV Food Network, CNN, and the Discovery Channel. Dr. Furman is a former world-class figure skater, and he was a member of the United States International and World Figure Skating Team. He has an absolutely beautiful family. He is the wonderful father of three daughters and a son, and he's a special friend of mine. And it's with, with much excitement that I would like to present to you Dr. Joel Furman. Thanks, Dan. That was really nice. Thank you. Okay, let's get started then. The theme of the presentation tonight is that disease is not the inevitable consequence of aging. It's not even predominantly genetics. We earn our illnesses through how we care for ourselves between birth and eventually we come down with some unfortunate tragedy in our life. The way right now in society, nutrition and disease is linked in the scientific literature. However, the medical profession, scientists, the populace has a very fragmented view of nutrition. And that fragmented viewpoint is causing people to die needlessly every day. Right now, 51% of our population dies of heart attacks and strokes. Nobody need die of a heart attack and stroke. Nobody has to die. Matter of fact, before we leave today, I want every person in this room to, t to make a decision whether they want to have a heart attack or don't they, because you can make a choice. You see, when we autopsy adult Americans who die in car accidents, 98% of those, those adults on autopsy show they have atherosclerosis. They have the hardening of the arteries lining the blood vessels. That blood vessel disease is seen in about 75% of children between 4 and 11 who die in car accidents and drownings. In other words, here's my point, that if you eat the American diet, you can't escape from the, nat the laws of biological laws of cause and effect. If you eat American food, you will develop American diseases. And with 50% of us dying of heart attacks and strokes and 35% dying of cancer, and about 80% of our population being overweight, we have one of the most unhealthy and sickly populations, and certainly the most overweight population in the history of the human race. While we're the most overweight society that ever lived, we've actually discovered the fountain of youth. We've actually discovered how almost every person can live in great health to pass the age of 100 and maintain their mental faculties and their physical vigor in their later years. And that fountain of youth is to eat a diet style that's richer in nutrients, especially phytochemicals, and lower in calories. In other words, the fountain of youth is to, is to eat less calories and more nutrients simultaneously. And this lecture is all about how every one of you can add 20, 30 years to your life, but more importantly, live into your older ages with your youthful vitality, your mental faculties, and without the fear of having cancer or heart disease. You see, this fragmented viewpoint of nutrition is best illustrated by the way we treat women who are pregnant. When you're pregnant, you're told to take folate, right? Because we found out that folate deficiency can cause neural tube defects when the babies are born. So when, the, when women are low, eat a diet style, which the American diet is low in folate, because we don't eat green vegetables. So when we don't eat green vegetables, we, we have babies that are deformed. So instead of telling women they need to eat green vegetables, what do we do? We tell them they have to take folate, right? That's good, because it saves a lot of children being born with deformities, right? But now, when the baby comes through the birth canal, and their head is compressed by the birth process, we found that a lot of babies bleed to death because they're low in vitamin K. So what they do is they're, it's, they, get a, a, they get a hemorrhage, a bleeding hemorrhage in their brain. So what we do, well, as soon as the baby is born, we give that baby a shot of vitamin K in the thigh. We give the baby a shot of vitamin K to prevent the baby's head from, the baby from bleeding into the brain, dying. You got that? 
We don't tell the women to eat vegetables that have vitamin K, green vegetables. Instead, we just give them a shot in the thigh. What's wrong with that? Isn't that make, make sense? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. Is that the leading cause of death in children is acute lymphocytic and myelocytic leukemia and Wilms tumors and brain tumors. Those are the leading cause of death in children. And those leading causes of death are linked to the low vegetable intake, especially green vegetables, that women eat 12 months before they get pregnant, the diet during their pregnancy, and their diet during their pregnancy. So what we've done by giving women, instead of instructing women that they have to eat a, a healthy diet, by giving them a shot, we've allowed more, more kids to die needlessly of lymphocytic leukemia and tumors. Did you follow that? We live in a very backward society. When I went to medical school, I, I headed the Nutritional Education Committee at University of Pennsylvania. And other doctors and researchers would tell me, you know, we'd, we'd have conversations about the causes of disease. Because the body's been designed to live a life free of disease. We're not, we're not made to break down. When we discuss that the causes of disease are largely known and they're predominantly due to nutritional ignorance, nutritional stupidity. And the other physicians and researchers would agree with me. The difference is they would say that we know that's true. However, people aren't going to want to eat healthy and they only want to take a pill and nobody's going to do that. That was their response. My response to that was, I would say in return, do you mean that it, it doesn't really matter what percent? 5% of the population, 25%, 40%, what percent would be willing to change their lifestyle to add 20, 30 years of good life, of years to their life? And in some cases, it's much more than that. I have a person who, who two houses, three houses down from me, who, a, a man who died at the age of 38 and left two young girls with no children. They just moved to Florida now because they couldn't afford living in this area of the country. And a woman diagonally across the street who had a heart attack at age 40. 40% 40 of all heart attack deaths, excuse me, in 40% of people who have heart attacks, they don't ever make it to the hospital alive. They're dead on their spot with their first heart attack. And most heart disease cannot be detected by stress tests, angioplasties, catheterization, because most of the plaque doesn't occlude the lumen. It's called extraluminal. The tumor, the, the cholesterol tumor, grows outward from the artery. So that vulnerability to have a heart attack are dependent on your waist measurement, your diet, of course, your cholesterol level, your blood pressure, and some other biochemical factors that are easily measured in a doctor's office. People are walking around at risk all the time when they don't have to be at risk. So I want every one of you to make a choice. I'm going to ask you later on. I want to know whether you think it's wise to walk around continuing risking a heart attack, living your life so you could drop dead at any minute. Or do you want to know exactly what it takes to protect yourself so you know with 100% certainty that you can't have a heart attack? I don't know about you guys. But I made this decision a long many years ago. I don't want to be running for a bus, skiing down a ski slope, playing tennis, or doing anything and think I'm going to drop dead. I want to live my life free of the fear of disease. And you can do that at the same time you can actually enjoy your lifestyle and enjoy your diet more. It's not about depriving yourself. It's not about not having the pleasurable effects of eating. Eating healthy doesn't have to be less pleasurable and taste not as, good, not as tasty as a diet that's more unhealthy. As a matter of fact, the unhealthy way Americans eat is actually, it deadens their taste buds and makes them enjoy their food less than a person eating this healthy lifestyle that we're going to talk about today. So with that as an introduction, let's get started. Obviously, the name of the book I had published last year is called Eat to Live. It was written for people who want to lose weight and live longer. But don't make no doubt about it, it's not predominantly a weight loss book. It really describes the ideal way people should eat to live longer and lose weight in the process. This slide just says that all the diseases that kill us and shorten our lives are related to being overweight. And the people that, and, the, and your waist measurement is a good estimate of you coming down with some problem later on in life. It's a good measurement of your health. We want to have a thinner waist is one of our goals. 
Now, what earns these dismal statistics, where 52% of all Americans die of heart attacks and strokes, and the rest of us die of cancer, what earns that is the way we eat, which is right here. So here you have 51% of the American diet is processed foods, and 42% is animal products. The most, the most toxic element in the American diet, the type, the substance in the American diet that's most closely linked with both heart attacks and cancer is saturated fat. The food that contributes the most saturated fat to the American diet are, is dairy products, cheese and butter. So cheese and butter, dairy products produce the most heart attacks and the most cancers. Saturated fat is the most dangerous thing you can possibly eat, especially when it comes from animal products. Because then it's, then it's mixed in with, other, with PCBs and dioxin and other ke um, chemical contaminants. Now 23% of the total, or, or over half of the animal product consumption in America, is dairy. If there was one food we could wipe out of the American diet with a magic wand and save as many lives as possible, it would be cheese and butter and da dairy products because they're the biggest contributor of saturated fat in the American diet. As animal products increase in the diet of any, nations, of any nation, so does both heart attacks and cancer and obesity. You see, animal products don't contain those antioxidants and phytochemicals that we talked about earlier that prevent children from having birth defects and getting cancer. Animal products don't contain vitamin E and vitamin C and vitamin K and folate. They don't contain the carotenoids like beta carotene and lutein and lycopene and alpha and gamma carotene. They don't contain lignans and phytochemicals. In other words, those nutri nutritive substances that give our body the artillery to fight off cancer are not in animal products. But they're rich in saturated fat and other, and other food elements that promote growth and replication of cells. They can make you get bigger. They make cells multiply. They promote cellular division in the sense that they promote cancer. And they don't contain those antioxidants and phytochemicals that controls the cell from getting diseased. Then we have 51% of the American diet over here is processed foods. Pasta, bread, salad oil, things made out of white flour products, sugar, donuts, cookies, crackers, rice cakes, breakfast bars, chips, cold cereals, cornflakes, rice krispies, pretzels, right? That's half the American diet. Those foods are also linked to both cancer and heart attacks and diabetes and obesity. And the, as those increase in a nation, we see the, the increase of obesity and cancer and heart disease and stroke go up, just like we do when animal products go up. They also don't contain all those nutrients I mentioned. The, in the processing, you lose, those benef you lose the vast majority. About 96% of the antioxidants are lost in processing, and about 90% of all minerals are lost in the processing. So those foods are nutritionally deficient, the processed foods we eat. Remember I said earlier, we're looking for a diet style richer in nutrients, right? How do we get richer in nutrients if we're living on foods that don't have the nutrients in them? We have to eat more of those foods that are rich in nutrients. And the foods that are richest in nutrients, that win the gold medal for nutrient density, are green vegetables. Now you see this slide, it says Americans eat 7% of calories from fruits and vegetables? That's incorrect, because that includes white potato. And white potato is the least nutrient dense of all vegetables. So if we look at um, vegetables, if we look at fruits and vegetables other than white potato, we're about 3.5 3 to 4% of the American diet, a ridiculously low level of vegetation. You guys understand this slide, don't you? Got this slide? Can you imagine the average American consumes 32 teaspoons of sugar a day? It's just hard to believe. And we know that the consumption of sugar and white flour isn't just linked to diabetes and obesity, it's also linked to cancer. Breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer are closely linked in the medical literature to the consumption of sugar and white flour. When we were kids, don't you remember the, the everybody's doctors and dietitians used to tell people the only thing wrong with sugar is that it causes cavities, 
right? Didn't you hear that as a kid? It's nothing wrong with it. it. Just causes cavities. Brush your teeth, you'll be fine. We know that that's not true. It's, it's spurred an epidemic of breast and prostate can colon cancer. These refined foods, because I give this lecture, and I have a lot of, often have a lot of vegetarians in the audience, and they think because they're on a vegetarian diet, they're protected. And they're wrong, because there can be a lot of things wrong with their vegetarian diet, especially if the diet is rich in processed foods. It's just as bad as eating animal products. You see, th this slide plots the percentage of calories of, of animal product and processed foods added together. That's the, oh, I'm sorry. The blue bar is the amount of unprocessed, unrefined plant food eaten in a nation. And the red bar shows the people dying of cancer and heart attack added together. Can you guys see that okay? Oops, now you can't. You see, as the percent of calories from unrefined plant foods increase, you can see it in the blue bar, the people dying of heart disease and cancer drops down to exceedingly low levels. We just don't see heart disease happening once the unrefined plant food intake crosses the 85% line. Now this slide is also incorrect. It's incorrect because it's based on 1970 statistics. If we try to do it on 2002 statistics, it, would, it wouldn't look, be such a good relationship here. It wouldn't look so good. Because we've exported American way of life all over the world. And even if you drive down the island of Fiji Islands or in Mozambique, or if you're in a Polynesian village, you see Pizza Hut and McDonald's and Burger King right there on the corner. And, the, and these people who are living on natural foods for so many years are now eating a diet similar to us. It's hard to find anywhere in the world today where they really eat a very healthy diet. It's very unfortunate. Everybody clear about this slide? I said earlier that your health is dependent on your nutrient per calorie density of your diet. You see, if we put an animal in a cage and we let this animal eat all the food it wants to eat in life, it'll live X amount of years. But if you take that same genetically bred species and feed it 30% less calories, 70% of what the first animal ate, the second group of animals will live 2x or 1.5 to 2x. Let me say that again. The only thing ever proven in the, in the history of science to significantly extend lifespan is, to, is eating less calories in a high nutrient environment. We want to try to get in as much nutrients as, can, as we can without eating more calories. So how do we do that? We have to eat more foods that are richer in nutrients, right? So we have to know what foods are high in nutrients and what foods are low in nutrients. So what, what food do you think wins the gold medal for nutrient density? I told you guys earlier. Green vegetables, right. If, if the nutrient density prize was won in a two mile race, green vegetables would win by more than a mile. You got that? Second place would be more than a mile back. Green vegetables are exceedingly high in nutrient density and they are the foods linked to, to lower heart attack rates and lower cancer rate. The green, consumption of green vegetables has the closest association, the best correlation with the reduction in the common causes of death in America. So the, this, has been well, this has been proven in more than 1,500 studies. In other words, scientists all over the world with all species of animals have shown the same thing, that eating less makes you live longer. Even the guidelines set by insurance companies and the, and the US government are permissively overweight and not ideal for human longevity. Clearly, the longest lived people are the leanest. And we know the mechanisms involved via which eating less calories in a high nutrient environment can dramatically extend lifespan. Dramatic effects even in humans, and it stops the parameters, the natural processes of aging, having to do with cross-linking of collagen and deposits of lipofusion and free radical generation. We know that eating a high nutrient diet with less calories present 
allows all of us to age at a much slower rate. I'm not going to go into all these mechanisms due to time. But here's an important message. It's that this plan has nothing to do with eating, with starving yourself and having near the willpower of iron to try to deny yourself to eat food. That's not what it's all about. It's all about when you eat the right foods that are rich in nutrients, though that high nutrient eating will naturally reduce your desire to eat so much food. Without trying, you'll be consuming 20 to 30 percent less calories just because your nutrient levels are so high in your diet. So this slide demonstrates, it says a key point. It says to avoid overeating on high calorie food, fill up on nutrient rich food. Because most Americans are addicted to their rich diet. And their addiction causes them to continue to overeat when they're not hungry. When you eat healthy and your brain gets the feedback signals from the digestive tract that your nutrient needs are, net, are met, you don't have perverted cravings, you don't want to eat as much food, and you don't feel like eating all the time. You automatically want to eat less calories and you will reach your ideal weight because you took in the ideal amount of nutrients into your system. Now look, most Americans never felt hunger in their whole life. They eat not because they hun they're hungry, they eat because they feel addiction, addictive withdrawal from their rich diet. How how, does anybody here know what the word addiction means? Nobody? <laughs> I guess I'll have to tell you then. Addiction means that when you stop doing something that's toxic, you get discomfort. And humans want to avoid discomfort, so they have a tendency to want to continue to do what they're used to doing. They want to continue their toxic.